Chubby, how are you, mate? Good, buddy. How are you? Good. I'll just turn the camera on. How's life, so, man? Yeah, life's good, mate. Life's good. I'm surprised I beat Palms on here. Big, big, mate, big I've been, cream, I've mate. been hitting him up for about, you know what he's like. I think he's doing about 15 different things at the moment. So, yeah, I get, yeah. I get a quick text. Oh, mate, you're free for coffee. He gives about five minutes notice, and then oh, <laughs> can you do it later? And he goes, Nah, sorry, I can't do it later. And then yes, yeah, so that's the say, same. It's the same for me. I won't hear from him for ages and I try not to bother him because I know he's got a lot going on. And then he'll be in Sydney and it'll be like, I'm in Cronulla. Do you want a coffee? And I'm going, mate, it's a Tuesday. I'm, you know, I'm at work. Yeah, <laughs> he's he always, does, he, he he's always been like much. that. Oh, 100%. But no, he's good. He's good. Every, mate, nation's capital's all good. We've been pretty lucky with everything that's gone on over the past year and a bit. So... Mate. Yeah, he's, he's kicking goals big time. Mate, good to hear, mate. Well, thanks for doing this. I I, I don't I don't know if you've listened to any, but I, I try not to plan too much what I'm going to ask. I, you know, I try and make it like you and I having a beer at the pub. But I was doing a little bit of reading this morning on some of your blogs. And, you know, of all the stuff you've done, I think, you know, obviously a rugby career is interesting, so that would be something to talk about. But for me life after rugby and, and some of the stuff you're doing now but let, let's start with retirement how how and why did you decide to retire from rugby uh there was three sort of culminating factors that all came uh at once one was uh just well my grandmother was diagnosed um to, yeah, she had pancreatic cancer, given you know, a few weeks to live, and she told me I should quit while I was ahead with my footy. Uh, and, you know, talking about Brums would, wanted to sort of move me on. I hadn't been playing great footy. And the third thing was I knew what I wanted to do in retirement as well. So I thought, oh, is, there's no perfect time to retire. Let's just do it. So, so three things all came uh, together at once where, yeah, a week before I hadn't thought about retiring, um, but then, yeah, just one of those, a crazy week, very crazy so, week, very emotional week. So, like, so it was just a switch like that and you're like, that's it, I'm done. Is that, is that how it worked? Yeah, I knew I would have at least, I would have maybe played one more year and then I was definitely done. So I could definitely see the finish line. Um, I would have liked to play one more season. You know, I knew the Brums, uh, they had a really good uh, squad for 2019 and, and I, yeah, I wanted to maybe try to have a crack at another World Cup, but I just wasn't balancing everything in my life really well in 2018 and I, um, yeah, was struggling at training, just wasn't keeping up with all the young fellas is what happens when you get older and it was just, yeah, it was time to, time to hang them up. How was that trans transition going from being a player and, and I'm asking for purely selfish reasons because I initially struggled with it and I think a lot of people actually do. But the, the transition from going from a player into the real world, what was that like? Did you did you struggle with it to start with or was it pretty seamless for you? Oh, definitely not seamless. And I'm still going with the transition. Like, um, So I was quite lucky that I sort of had two practices. So when my kids were born... Took three months off, so I had three months to just be totally in charge of my own calendar. No one telling me what to do. I had to figure everything out myself. And then the next year, I took six months off. So as soon as Super was rugby was over, I only signed a six-month contract, so I didn't have to play NRC, nothing. And then didn't come back to Brumbies till January the next year. So I sort of had two practices at it, and, and it gave me a lot of time to think about what I would miss in retirement. And it really boils down, for me, it boils down to two things. One is, you know, you miss getting paid to exercise with your mates every day. That I think, um, I think especially for blokes, like, you know, when it's it's awesome playing professional sport, especially when you're in a team with everyone, you know, all the, who are all your mates and you're just getting paid to exercise all day with your friends. Like, that's awesome. So I thought, well, that's going to be hard to replace in retirement. So I've had to... Um, I've had to be very conscious and scheduling time to exercise with friends into my weekly calendar. So obviously I can't do it all day because I've got work to do, but I can try and fit it in at the end, either the beginning or the end of the day. Um, but it's a lot harder because all my friends have all got work and everyone's got kids. So it is really, uh, really tough 
well, it's much tougher logistically to try and manage that. Whereas with footy, you just rock up and everyone starts training and hanging out and having a laugh. So just, yeah, being really mindful around that, that was sort of one thing. And the other thing was just finding a job that I loved as much as playing footy. I was, you know, my, my old man loves what he does. He's a, he's a pediatric geneticist. He's been doing it for 30, 40 years. And now he's now the most exciting part of his career because now technology is now good enough to do all the stuff with genetics that they sort of visioned 30, you know, nearly half a century ago now. So um, he always told me yeah, from a very young age, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And so that was always in the back of my mind from a young age, which is, yeah, I didn't find anything else I liked when I finished school. I didn't like studying very much and went to UC to start sp studying sports journalism, but I loved footy. And so I kept playing even when I retired just because I loved it. I never thought I'd be good enough to ever play one day for the one game for the Brumbies or Wallabies. Like it was never, ever a thought in my mind until the day it happened. I just kept playing because I loved it. And I was lucky that I found um, working on something while I was still playing, which is, which is Alfred. And we can talk about that, but I love working on that as much as I do playing footy. And um, with the exercise, with the exercise thing, do you think it's just as much the exercise as it is the social interaction for men? It's both. So the I did it when, especially when I don't have you. Did you ever play with Vicks with Dan Vickerman? You might have played, I played some. Played against played, him a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. So when he committed suicide, that was really um, that was a real shock for me. Especially, I only played twenty eleven World Cup with him, but I, him, and I bonded and uh, we hung out quite a lot on that tour. Uh, and, yeah, it was really sad. He had a, the same injury that I had. We'd both snapped our legs in half and we'd had metal poles put in. And, when he, yeah, to see him, um, yeah, to hear that news, that was just such a big shock. And I sort of thought, well, you know, I feel really good. Like, playing, I'm a happy guy, everything's good. But I sort of worried, oh, well, you know, could this happen to me in retirement? So I did a lot of, re like, just a lot of YouTube, going down rabbit holes, learning sort of how brain chemicals work and, yeah, a lot of it that a lot of that, and or just trying to learn how the brain works on YouTube, and then probably not the best place to go. Probably should go to a university and learn neuroscience, like our dear friend Daniel Palmer. But we'll just um, speak. Then. Just speak. Yeah, well, I do. It. No, we have. I have spoken a lot about trying to. I mean, he gets into the deep molecular level. I'm just like, mate, keep it simple for us simpletons. But, um, but yeah, a lot of it was just learning around how endorphins work, which is what the chemical your brain gets when you exercise, and that it's called nature's morphine. So, sort of that, and then obviously there's the the bonding chemi neurochemical, which is oxytocin. So, I think when you're exercising with your friends, you're getting both oxytocin and um, and endorphins and i just think that's yeah i think that's a great mix and when you do that i think life's pretty good so for you you did a very unusual thing for a tight head loose head prop you actually jumped into running why running um well this is the week after i retired so it's a saturday after and just a mate of my i hadn't done any exercise that week you know we're still my grandmother hadn't passed but we'd found out she was terminally ill and so it was a pretty tough time, but then, um, and I, yeah, because I'd grown up very close with her, uh, and just a mate of mine said it was Saturday, Friday afternoon. He's like, "Mate, who wants to come to Park Run tomorrow?" I was like, well, "What's Park Run?" He goes, well, "Just come on." Another mate, it was in a WhatsApp group, and another mate of mine said, "Yeah, I'll come." So I was like, "All right, I'll come too." And there's just one just down the road here, and there's eight in Canberra, but there's one just down the road here, and just rocked up and all it is is a it's a just a five kilometer run it's timed and there's volunteers and hundreds of people do it uh, at each one um and just got into it so each you know i didn't have footy on saturdays but i had i needed a way just to sort of challenge myself and something to train for during the week now that i didn't have rugby and so it just came along at the the best time i've been so used to training all week to then go and compete on saturday it was just a really nice progression so i'd you know do a few runs during the week i'd still go to the gym and do some weights and and then on saturdays i'd have a crack and try and beat my pb so that was like a just a very nice progression and uh yeah i i don't run hard at all i still go every saturday and do park run but it's more just jog and just catch up with friends and we'll even just talk and catch up during the run or um, did one in kingscliff on the weekend there's park run nice. there i mean they're they're everywhere they're everywhere but um 
so yeah, that got me into running and then gotten into a few other things running wise, but so it's been a great replacement for rugby for me. Well, I guess it's got everything. So you've got your social interaction, which I, I, as we said, I think men desperately need. Um, plus you've got your purpose and you've got something that you've got to commit to. Plus you've got the endorphins from the running as well. So it's yep. really got, got a mix of everything. Let's talk about business. So something that's always interested me about you is you've kind of always had a little bit of a buy for business. I think you started the dock bar while you were still playing. Is, is that right? I didn't start it. I was asked to be involved from the beginning. So um, some, well, sorry, step back when I was at university here in Canberra before I played for the Brumbies, I was a very, I was a regular at a pub called The Lighthouse here in Canberra. And I went so often when I was at uni, I got to know the family that owned it. And then they were looking to start a new bar. uh, And then they asked me and then I got Scott Farty involved as well. And and that's the best stuff. As an yeah, 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 but I still I do a shift down there a week and still help like with a bit of marketing stuff and yeah, an active investor is probably the best way to describe my role there. But um, no, we're super proud of the place. But but you're also doing uh, Alfred, which I downloaded yesterday because I wanted to test it out before I talk about it. But you also got you've also got a well, your wife's doing an app called Fan. Is is that right? Yep, so that's you've got correct. A, you got a few things on the go. Why did you start Alfred? Um, so when I was playing, you'd be able to sympathize with this. And I know our friend Daniel Palmer can sympathize as, as a front row. Most of us end up in fat club after every holidays, we come back from holidays. Uh, yeah, it's been good, good time, very festive. And anyway, so I I'd be fat- out of it. oh, well, I did eventually. And I'll, and this is, so yeah, I think I was in it for the first seven seasons of my career as in Brumby's fat club. And I finally got out of it and it all was down to tracking my food. And so I used my fitness pal uh, yeah. and loved it. I was like, oh, how good is this? I've you know, got control of my, my, my weight. Um, it's freed up my mind. I don't, you know, I don't beat myself up for being a fat mess anymore. Like I was like, oh, this is great. And so whenever my friends and family would go, oh, you know, I want to lose a bit of weight, I'd go, oh, just download fitness pal and track, track your food. So they'd all download it, uh, maybe give it a, a crack for a day or so, but no one would stick to it. And that went on for about a year and a half. And I was just thinking, oh, well, like, why? Like, this is awesome. Tracking my food has changed my life. Why aren't people sort of feeling the same way? And I sort of looked into it a little bit and I realized that my fitness power was actually built for bodybuilders who are super obsessive and, you know, their life and career depends on them getting their macronutrients right and weighing their food. And I realized, well, but they're just, yeah, all my friends and family don't want to be as um, hardcore as bodybuilders. They just, um, which, yeah, you don't, you don't need to be as hardcore with it. So that just, so I was thinking, yeah, for a long time, maybe I could make a, a diet tracker where I could do all the work for people. They could just send a photo or a little text and we do all the work for them. So that was the idea for Alfred. And that was nearly about five years ago now. Uh, and it took me Our first three cracks at it all fell apart. There were just too many bugs with the versions and we couldn't get it right. But um, with thanks to some help from some guys from uh, a a couple of mates here in Canberra, we now launched uh, Christmas Eve and, yeah, we're on the App Store and, yeah, going well. Mate, so I've tried most of the other um, fitness food tracker things and the thing I like, the, the thing that messed me up is, you know, if I'm cooking all my food and weighing it all, it's fine. It's still a bit tedious, but it's fine. But if you go, if you went out to a restaurant or you went to the pub and had dinner, you'd struggle to track what you were eating there because you go, oh, there's two cups of chips or salad or whatever. But the thing you've done, which is really smart, is you take a photo of it, describe what it is, and then someone in your team, is, is it you that does it? Oh, there's me and we have two uh, nutrition students from the University of Canberra. So you, you will update the app with the calories or the estimated calories that I've eaten for that meal. And I'm going, oh, this this actually is, a, for me, that's the biggest difference between the other apps. Is that kind of what you were going for? Yep, we do all the, the manual labour, all the data entry for you. Did you build the app yourself or did you get people to help you with it? No, I, I, I've done a little bit of coding at ANU, at, at, back at ANU doing computing and I... Did do a bit for the first version of FAM, which is what my wife works on, but no, I haven't done any coding for Alfred. Well, how, how, are you, 
how do I phrase it? How are you going to make a buck out of it? It'll be a subscription eventually. Eventually. So you're going to build your user base, get people saying that it's a great product. Then, then you're going to go, it's this per year. Yep. Something like that. Mate, I've, I've really enjoyed it. So that's, is that your full-time job for you now or are you doing anything else as well? No, that's, that's my work as Alfred. Okay. What are you doing? Are you doing anything in rugby still or you, is that completely over for you? Uh, I just recently joined the Brumbies board. So, I saw that. So, so Paddy, Paddy, Mc, Paddy McCabe just about to have his third child. So he's stood down and I've taken uh, the players representative or rugby union players association. They have a spot on every board. And so now yeah, I'm the players association rep on the Brumbies board. So that, um, that, and then I, and I'll still help out union North. So I'm going to play you know, the last few rounds. Play. Club, yeah. Club footy. So just help out and, Club's in good shape, so I just want to help out coming into the business end of the season. Did coaching ever interest you? Oh, yeah, maybe one day, but I Alfred is, yeah. Alf- <laughs> so that's true. That's true enough, enough of your time now to, to completely fill your plate as well. I think you've got three kids now as well, don't you? Yeah. Yep. So, no, it's out. Yeah, we've got, yeah, we have meals coming through all the time. So we got to quickly jump on and... Eventually, the plan is we'll have it all automated, but we have to do it manually for a while to get um, to really understand how the algorithm and, and how to automate it. We have to do it manually for hopefully, hopefully, only another year, and then we can start automating you know, parts of it. Okay. Well, mate, I hope it goes well. I'm a big fan, so I'll be using it. Let's talk a little bit about rugby. Something you and I have in common is we both lived in Bedford in the UK. Oh, did you? Okay, yeah. I, I was there the year after you were there. Um, I was playing for like the neighbouring town, but actually living in Bedford. What was that? What was that experience like for you? It was awesome. It was awesome. So I, um, how old was I? Twenty one, I think, when I went over, and um, it was just good growing up experience for me. Like I'd moved out of home when I was eighteen and was living in Canberra, even though my parents are in Sydney. But to just, yeah, uproot and move to another country was, um, yeah, it was great learning experience, great club, still really good mates, a lot of players. But, I mean, footy-wise, the best thing for me was just seeing that there's another or there's many ways you can play the game. So I'd only ever really watched Australia play and, you know, the Australian style of footy, but we played a lot of really, you know, some English clubs that just, as soon as the ball gets the five out, they kick it and it'd just be scrums and malls in the wet all day. So it was a great learning experience just to see that there was, you know, many ways you can skin a cat for, in a rugby context sense. Was that, so your that first, was, awesome. was that your first taste of professional rugby? Oh, uh, I'd, the year before, I'd finally gotten into the Brumbies. I got a training contract with the Brumbies. So I got promoted from the academy but then I broke my leg, which is what um, the same injury Dan Vickerman had. And yeah. I was out for 12 months. So I missed the whole 2006 season. And then that's when Bedford were like, so the English season sort of starts at the end of Super Rugby. So I yeah, had missed a whole year with Brums. Um, and so they obviously had to fill the gap. They'd signed another prop. So I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll... Yeah, needed to get some games under the belt because I'd spent the whole time rehabbing my broken leg. So I went to Europe. I went to England, yeah, played that and then came back and lucky. Well, after that, yeah, didn't play all that well because I still had that metal pole in my leg and and I wasn't very, uh, it was the first time getting paid to play. So there's a lot of beers, a lot of big weekends after games and stuff as a young 21-year-old. Um, yeah, as a young 21-year-old getting paid to play rugby for the first time, I sort of was like, how good's this? And, um, you know, probably... Not that I didn't take my rugby seriously, but I wasn't as professional as I should have been. But yeah. then, yeah, came back to Australia, had no contract, no contract offers. So I was really sort of at a crossroad, planning to go back to uni. But lucky the, the ARC was coming up. And um, so I was in the Western Sydney Rams training squad for that. Didn't initially get picked, got dropped from the squad um, for the for the cop. But they're lucky. Ben, well, unfortunately for Ben Robinson, he, he broke his hand or arm, I think, in the first round. So then I got called back in for round two. And then I think I got man of the match. And then maybe the two weeks after the Brumbies offered me a contract to come back and, and the rest is history. Um, firstly, did you ever count the amount of pubs on the high street in Bedford? The Rose. There was the Rose. There was the one. i trying to remember the one across the road. 
I counted was, about 20, 26. Yeah, there were some good ones. The Rose was the main one. Um, the, the second thing I was going to ask, so you, you came back, you played the ARC, you were signed by the Brumbies. How many games did you play before you played for the Wallabies? Because if my memory is correct, it was pretty soon after, was it, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So after every – well, the answer is like four or five off the bench, something, something like that. But I think if you look after every World Cup cycle, especially when a new coach comes in, there's a bit of a clean out and they give young they, – they pick a lot of young guys probably a bit earlier than when they're ready to give them four years to get ready for the next World Cup. So I was really lucky that it was sort of Robbie Dean's just got signed. It was his first season and I was at the big, that was the beginning of the next cycle to get ready for the 2011 World Cup. So yeah, yeah I, I was absolutely not ready for that to get the call that you made the Wallaby squad. And um, yeah, kind of like what I was alluding to before, never ever in my wildest dreams did I ever think I'd be good enough to play for the Brumbies, let alone Wallabies. And even, yeah, playing in that... Um, the Brums that year, I just was just so over the moon to have even gotten just a run for the Brums. Being on the Wallabies was nowhere near my radar. So that, um, yeah, that was a big shock. Looking back now, do you think you were ready for it at the time or was it just a little bit early? Oh, absolutely not ready. But when, when are you, re- like, when, when is ready, you know, like, yeah, no, like, in hearts, absolutely no one. I mean, I played some of my best footy in those first few years, like some of my best... Wallaby footy was in probably 09, my second season. I think I had some of my best games. So from that context, you could say I was. But um, the game changed a lot sort of 2012 when they started having two props on the bench. And sort of my point of difference was that I could play 80 minutes both sides. So I I was, yeah, starting every week because you can only sub one prop. But as soon as in 2012 when they brought a second prop on the bench, you didn't need a prop to play 80 minutes anymore. So my sort of, yeah, my sort of value or place in the game definitely um, was on the decline from from that rule change. I was going to talk to you about that because you were one of the the last sort of guys that could genuinely play both sides. Was it something that you took to easily or was it something that, like, like, why did you end up playing both sides? Because a lot of guys don't. Oh, I just play wherever I was told. And I think Robbie so Dean... Simp- so it was as simple as that? Yep. And I was super lucky. He gave me plenty of chances and plenty of time to, you know, try and learn the position. But tight end's one, you, you're never, like, you're never there. You, you know, like, you'll you never stop learning. And the moment you think you got your, your shit sorted, you'll get your ass handed to you. So... Um, yeah, it was literally... Robbie just wanted to try and get me and Benny Robbo around in that... Yeah, in the same team. But Robbo was one of the best props in the world, let alone Australia at the time. So I sort of had to learn tight end. And, um, yeah, I mean, in heights, I would have liked to just play, maybe play loose end my whole career. But that if in the perfect world, but I was just grateful to get picked and just play. I would have played second row. I would have played flanker. I would have even played winger if they told me to. I just yeah, I just rocked up wherever I was. To be the team. Um, to be something the I've team. been talking to a few guys about lately is is mentors. Because I think it's important for young players and and sort of old players and businessmen. In ter- in a rugby sense, who were your mentors when you first got into that Wallaby system and the Brumby system? Yeah, I mean, in those first few years, it was certainly like, you know, the guys I looked up to most, especially from watching them on telly leading up to it, sort of like Sterling Mortlock, George Smith, those guys. Um I think Sterlow was still Wallaby captain at the time. So um, he was certainly one. I mean, George was my favourite player long before I came to the Brahms. I love watching. So to be in the same team as him, not just, you know, for a few matches, but all year, Brahms and then go to the Wallabies with him. He was someone I really looked up to. And I mean, they're two greats of the game. So they were they were probably the two most early on. Um, there was a lot of people that I looked up to. In what, about, what about from a front row perspective? Well, honestly, most I learnt from was Dan was our mate Palms. He's just an absolute guru at scrummaging, like not just physically and because he's strong. He he just absolutely understands that he's very a good communicator of it as well. And he was probably the one I learnt the most off. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of heaps of scrum coaches I learnt from all of them, but Palms was certainly one 
and to get to play with him. And obviously we you know, go at each other at training at practice scrums and you just, yeah, he was probably the one, the bloke I learned the most off as far as scrummaging was. was. Um, I agree totally. I've, nearly everything I've learned um, from scrummaging has probably come from palms. What about the mental side of the game? So some, something I've been talking to a lot of people about lately and, um, you know, like Mike Hooper struggled with it a little bit, but having that pre-game anxiety, the performance anxiety, because in, in the world that you just left, you're being judged every single day, every single week on your performances, which is a really unusual way for a man or a woman to live their 20s and 30, early 30s. Did you struggle with that? Or was it something that came easy for you? And if you did struggle with it, did you talk to anyone about it? Oh, I was my harshest judge. So, what I mean, yeah, I was absolutely my harshest judge. So, <laughs> yeah. so other people's, I mean, but absolutely other people's criticism still hurt. And I think we were sort of the first era really to play during with social media. And so, in the past, if you get criticized, you know, it might just be in a newspaper or something. And so, you just avoid the newspapers. But it's pretty hard to avoid social media and chat forums and stuff. And so I really struggled, especially when I was trying so hard. I was training my ass off. And, you know, you get smashed at scrum time and you just cop it online from people, especially for the people you're trying to represent and you're trying to make them proud. That was that was really hard, learning to deal with that. But I have seen a really good clip from the Amazon founder, that, that Jeff Bezos, where he talks about dealing with criticism and it was – you talked about there was two types of critics. That there's one, there's people that like, you know, they're genuine fans and they want you to do better. And you should like, and I'd look through, yeah, through criticism online and you would see that there were a lot of people that come on, they're big Wallaby fans. They're like, come on, Benny, Alexander, get your shit together. We want, you know, they want they want me to me and the team to do well. And so their criticism was more out of frustration. And that you can live with, like that's great. You'd rather that than people not give a shit at all. But then there were the other type and they were just people who were just bitter and twisted and miserable, their own lives and them. And they were looking for people to pick holes in um, and to just, just to make themselves feel better. They're just like, they're, they're, they're keyboard warriors. And you see it with the doc. I go to TripAdvisor and you see um, ratings of the doc, especially when we first opened, some people say it's great. And then you get some people give you one star out of five and you go through... Um, and you go to their profile and you see they've given everywhere one stars. And you're like, oh, that's just a miserable fuck who just yeah. going around trying to be negative because when they, you know, they get to criticise someone else, it makes themself feel good. So I wish I'd learnt all that earlier in my career um, because it was tough dealing with that online criticism because there was no, no, like, players had gone through that, I guess. It was because, you know, especially Instagram and Twitter and all that sort of started 08, 09, Facebook sort of 06, 07. So, yeah, learning to deal with that was... Um, was that just having, something you dealt with, dealt with on your... on your? Because it's... it's a, I'm trying to give people a picture of, of what it's like, really, because it's a very high-stress, high-pressure environment. You're representing your country or your state. You want to do well. Like you don't get to, you don't play 150 super rugby games at the front row if you're not a proud, you know, disciplined, strong person. I, is it something you just learn to deal with over time, or did you speak to anyone about it? Or I guess I'm just trying to dig into that a little bit. No, nah, so I I just had to learn to deal with it because there wasn't. Um, yeah. There wasn't the stuff that, this around you know, in terms of psychologists and. That sort of stuff. Yeah. Oh, but dealing with social media, it was such a new thing. I mean, yeah, you see all the time you see athletes and players really struggling with it these days. I mean, that Naomi Osaka really struggling with even just doing press conferences. It is hard, but I guess it all comes down to how you look at it. And you could say, I, I tried to look at it as a positive because it means people at least cared and were watching. I mean, I could go and play for third grade Uni North and no one would give a shit. And so I'd like, you know, you wouldn't get, not, not that up the hours go the third graders if you're watching, but my point, I guess my point is it, it's a, it's a, it just comes with the territory of representing a large group of people that some people are going to be happy with the job you do and some don't, but um, just being grateful that you're, you're even there getting a crack to, and I think there's another quote, I'm trying to remember her. 
There's something about it's it's an old one about like glory really belongs to those who are in the arena. Um, yeah, uh, the man, the man of the arena. Yeah, I'll, yeah I'll try so and find that. It's a really so good that, one. Yeah, and so I'm just, I just, yeah. After I wish, and I got to maybe by the probably two or three years. Oh, actually, a lot of it tied around once I got my eating and my weight under control. I was a lot more confident person, and it didn't the criticism didn't affect me. But when I was still a young guy, still you know, still really struggling my weight, still maybe a little bit insecure. The criticism really probably affected me more. But as I got a bit older and wiser, and um, yeah, and, and and heard especially you know some strategies of dealing with just criticism in general, not obviously online criticism, but criticism in general. Um, yeah, it doesn't really, criticism doesn't bother me. In fact, I actually like sort of revel in it now and use it as fuel to just go out and prove them wrong and actually so actively go looking for criticism now. So Mate, that's a, that's a good way of looking at it. Um, you had a really long career looking back now, can you actually pinpoint what it was that made you stay around for so long? Because not stay around for so long, but you, you performed at the highest level for, how many years? 12 years? Longer? Yeah, about 11, 11 12 years. Yeah, 11, 12 years in, in the hardest position in the game. Is, when you look back, is there something that you can pinpoint of why you did for so long? There's a couple, but I mean, uh, there was a guy, his head of performance at Rugby Australia now, Dean Benton. So he, he so 2010, so step back. 2010 and 11, Brumbies, we, are the, we were the Real Madrid of Australian rugby. We came second last. We sucked. Like, we were, terrible. We were a mess. And then 2012, Jake White came in. There was, you know, we had really a lot of senior players left. We had a really young squad. Uh, but Jake brought in this guy who'd worked under Eddie Jones, who of head of athletic performance here, Dean Benton. And he got us a, a, a chef. And he even got us a sleep room. And so we'd rock up to training and we'd get breakfast cooked for us. And then we'd go train, we'd come back, we'd have lunch all cooked for us and we'd go have a sleep. And then you'd go and train in the afternoon and everyone's like results in the gym, everyone's skin folds every week just, just took off. And we went from second last to within 10 minutes of winning a grand final in New Zealand. We won a preliminary final in South Africa, um, which, you know, we just, yeah, the travel got us in that last 10 minutes. It would have been some fairy tale to finish that off. But um, he taught me, well, the number one lesson here yeah, that he taught me and probably the number one lesson at all of footy that I got that I still use to this day was I was like struggling at training. I'm like, Dean, I'm training really hard, you know. I'm, I'm trying really hard. And he goes, Benny, I don't care how hard you're training. Just focus on your eating and your sleeping. He added in flexibility, but I'll just say eating and sleeping. And he said, and your training will take care of itself. If you just focus on getting a good night's sleep and eating well, you'll feel really good and you'll have tons of energy for training. And just looking at like that, I'd been so focused on putting all my effort into my training. Um, just that flick of the switch. And instead of putting my foot into that, I put my effort into my sleeping and my eating. And then I had heaps of energy. I felt great. And then I just trained really well. And, uh, and that's something my wife and I still do to this day. We don't fo try not focus on our kids and work. We focus on our health, which is, I, I like to think of health as our energy levels. And the best two ways to get your energy levels up is a good night's sleep and to eat, eat good energy, eat good food. So we, yeah, we focus really hard on our habits and, and our eating and our sleeping. So we've got the energy to then go and deal with kids, to deal with business and, and to deal with everything. So uh, that that would be it. in one thing. It was that lesson I learned from Dean has probably added, it would have added three or four years to my career. And with um, like staying in Canberra, it's just, I loved it. You know, my wife was a Canberra girl. Um, so once we got married, I started having kids and then obviously we opened the dock all around the same time. So I had stuff going on outside of rugby. So, and then what love to you know, retire as a one club player. So all those things fat weighed up as to why I stayed. One of, one of the things I've noticed, uh, with talking to guys like yourself and Kieran Reed and, uh, hoops is that there's almost like a sense of enjoyment out of it because like yeah the money's nice you get to travel the world you're representing the country but like what you guys do is is hard and if you're not enjoying yourself i don't think and you, you've probably seen just as many examples of, as i have if, 
you know, a young guy who'll go into the pro system and then get spit out the back end and goes, oh, that's not quite what I thought it was. So did you enjoy it is, I guess, what I'm asking. Absolutely. And I think the people that don't enjoy it think it's all going to be beer and Skittles. Like, it's hard. Like, but you've got to look at, well, what else would you be doing? And so I'll, I'll never forget after my first week of training with the Brahms, I was uh, living with my grandparents that they, they're here in Canberra. And I was just, cause I'd just come back from Sydney. I hadn't sorted out anywhere to live yet. So I was crashing with the grandparents for the first week or two. And I remember after a training session, I went home via uh, the uh, Westfield. There's a food court there and I was getting some, an early dinner. And I remember just sitting around watching people clearing plates and, you know, clearing, working at takeaway stands. I'm just thinking, I just got paid to play for train for footy all day. How good is that? I mean, I, I mean, not that I had any great skills or qualifications where I could be off doing, you know, an astronaut or, or I had some, or, you know, a doctor or whatever. Like I didn't have some amazing career that I sacrificed to play rugby. But I just, from the very get-go, I was just like, geez, I'm getting played to play footy. That's like pretty, that's pretty awesome. Try not to stuff it up, Ben. Give it a crack. And so, and I guess my parents from a young age were always like, didn't care about my marks. I always looked at the effort on my report card and if the effort was down then they'd yeah they'd really get into me they didn't never looked at the marks they always just looked at the effort so i guess that um yeah that just yeah Wait, that, i think all that that way of looking at it i guess also set me up to have a long career yeah i was just going to say it's, it's amazing how many people achieve a lot through hard work and having a bit of gratitude and you clearly did in regards to your rugby career i want to ask you about the brumbies so there's countless examples of people playing for other franchises in Australia. We won't name them. We won't name the franchise. But they'll go to another franchise with a good program and a good culture and a good system, and then all of a sudden they're world beaters. So the, the Brumbies is one of those places that, from an outsider looking in and knowing a, cu a couple of the guys that have been there, seems to have a good culture, seems to have a great system. What... What is it from your perspective that makes the Brumbies what they are? There's probably three things. One, one sort of the founding story of the Brumbies and sort of the, you know, the Gregans, the Larkhams and the success that they had. And so the bar's set up here, if you play for the Brumbies, they were the most successful Australian franchise. And so there's an expectation and a belief that it can be done because it's been done before, so by the Brums. So that so, you know, the Rebels are forced. They're still trying to win their maiden title. So whether they ever win one, who knows? I hope they do. But with the Brums, have, yeah, there's there's that legacy and the story, the founding story, which I guess ties into the founding story, ties into the second point, is that a lot of people come there with a point to prove. They're cast out by you know, the Waratahs or the Reds, so they're really they're a bit fucked off and got a chip on their shoulder, and that drives them to train really hard and to... And to, um, yeah, to prove a point. So they really got, yeah, fuel under fire. They just didn't get given a contract straight out of school and told how wonderful they are. They've been told you're not good enough and you've got to go look somewhere else, sorry. And that really does fuel people. I mean, I didn't get any offers to go to the Waratahs straight out of school. Um, I mean, yeah, Benny Robbo was, him and I played sort of the same position at school and he was, yeah, he was, oh, he was good even from, from back then. So I... Um, so that fuels people. And then the third, the third's also just Canberra as a city. So I, I couldn't imagine how hard. I always wondered how Michael Hooper would get to training from Manly to SFS or wherever they trade, like just the logistics around it. Canberra is such an easy city. So I lived, I lived quite a fair way from training and that was only a 15-minute drive. But most people lived within a five-minute drive. So that just makes it so easy to get to training, not be you know stressed out from spending an hour in traffic, so you train really well. And then outside of training, it's really easy to go grab a feed with, with one of your teammates or even catch up in the evening or spend your days off together. I think with Sydney, I know the Waratahs have got people up on the northern beaches, people out west, people down south. What are the chances if you and you were in the Tars with hoops that you would catch up with him on a day off? Oh, I wouldn't, no. You wouldn't. It's, and not because you guys are, wouldn't be good mates, it's just the logistics of it. It's just, yeah. it's a big camp, and you look at like that trend across a lot of other, I mean, you compare it to, well, big cities have got their advantages. I'm only just highlighting a negative of playing in a big city, but I think you do look at, you know, the history in England, like Leicester were a smaller city. They were, you know, very successful. 
Um, Crusaders, they're a smaller city compared to the, the big city of Auckland. Um, yeah, I just think there's something in smaller cities that just make it more conducive for a team to be close and knit and, and to just be tighter. And then that reflects in success on the field. Has the culture there always been driven by the players? It went through some cycles. So it was definitely player driven with the Gregans and the Larkhams and the Roths and the Mortlocks and that. And then it's sort of, a, there was a huge thing around when Andy Friend got moved on that maybe they said player power had become too much. Uh, and I think it's sort of went, it's come back a bit. It's found a bit better balance, you know, like um, you got to have strong leaders. I mean, I think the best story about strong leadership with, from a playing group, I think goes back to the All Blacks at the 2011 World Cup. When I think it was... Um, Corey Jane and one of the other, Israel Dag, I think they went out on the piss before, like a midweeker before their quarterfinal against Argentina. But then you hear stories about how they had to front up the next morning, not to the coaches, but to the senior players. So your Richie McCaws, your Brad Thorns, your Dan Carters, your Tony Woodcox. Which would be way Milano, worse. Way which worse was apparently, well, yeah, apparently like McCaw nearly ripped him to shred. I don't know exactly what was said in that meeting, but you know who the two best players were in that quarterfinal for the All Blacks? It was Israel Dagg and Corey Jane. They were unbelievable for the rest of that tournament because I, I think they just didn't want to let the senior players down. Whatever those senior players said to them. Um, yeah, so I, I do think you've got to have great leadership from coaches like as well. Like it, it does start from the coaches, but, I mean, a great coach – will create great senior players and a great leadership culture, I think. Um, but that, I guess that, that's easier said than done and certainly takes time. But the Brahms certainly had that with the Gregans and the Larkhams, but then as a club from that 04 premiership, it just over time was just, con- just sliding down the ladder, down the ladder, and then 2011, it just <laughs> bottomed out. Uh, but then 2012 went back up and it's it's Brahms have always been sort of probably top two Aussie sides ever since. Um, that rebuild in 2012. What coaching influences have you had throughout your career? In what probably regard? For, well, that's what probably, a, probably a fairly vague question. I, I just, I probably wanted to dig into to some of the coaches you've had and, you know, any takeaways that you've had from them in terms of your playing career, uh, stuff you can take away after your career. Probably a fairly open-ended question. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Just no, dig into whatever question. you think. Yeah, good question. I guess the coach I'm most thankful, there's a few, like my, Robbie Dean's got me to believe that I could be better than I ever thought I could be. And I'll be forever grateful to him for that. Um, how he did it, I still sort of struggle to put my, I mean, picking me early and, and just little conversations he had with me. And um, yeah, I never thought I was ever much chop playing, much chop of a footy player growing up. I just kept doing it because I loved it. But he, he sort of helped cultivate my self belief. So I'm always grateful to Dingo for that. Um, Michael Checker, even though I didn't play much under him, I really liked that analogy he used with the Waratahs, with the just let the club swing that he used uh, in the lead up to that oath, that their grand final win. Uh, that really resonated with me for the rest of my career after hearing that because I'd sort of gone into my shell as a player a lot, just from, you know, some being part of a few really tough losses and a lot of cr- online criticism, I'd sort of gone back into my shell. So even though I didn't hear that directly from him, I think that was, that was great. Um, Laurie Fisher, huge amount of respect for him and just uh, owe him, owe him a ton. He's been a great sort of guide for me throughout my entire career. He was a uni North stalwart from my club here in Canberra. And um, he, yeah, he gave me my first crack at the Brums and, um, it was just great to it just, yeah, just a more knowledgeable forwards coach you'll never meet. He just Palm. awesome. And, Palm yeah. speaks incredibly highly of him. Oh, and, he's um, awesome. That's probably the best compliment you can get, really. You know. Yeah, no, he, he's just awesome. And he never needed to fire up as a forward for a game. You just rock up and then, you know, an hour or, so, or hour and a half before the game, Laurie would sit the forward pack around in a circle and he'd just read you some of his thoughts and he just had you ready to go. Like, he just... Very clear communicator. He, he laid out very clearly what we needed to do to win the game and um, just a great servant of rugby and a great servant of, of the Brumbies. And um, he's one of, the, yeah, it's people like him that sort of keep 
key base of T Rugby Strong. He's certainly one of about three or four people, along with the CEO, Phil Thompson, and Gary Quinn live in the old the old fart that fills up the water. It's sort of those those blokes um, that keep the place going. And Dean, I guess, is a, um, Dean Benton, even though he was strength and conditioning, I learned a lot of just about how to get the best out of my body. And uh, Damian Marsh was another one. Um, he's obviously, he's the most successful Australian trainer. He was the trainer for the Brums in, uh, or he was at the Brums in 01, 04, when they won the title. He was the Reds trainer in 2011 when they won. He's the Reds trainer again now when they won. So he was another guy, um, the strength and conditioning coaches, that just taught me a lot about the body and how to get the most out of it and how to look after it. Uh, they're probably, I mean, those are some of the lessons that I sort of still to this day really, um, well, they, they just led me down on a path of, of learning about health and um, that, yeah, that I, I just think everyone should learn yeah, about health and how to get the most out of their body and how to look after it because it really is um, a gift that keeps on giving, especially as you get older, if you know how to look after your body and, you know, if your knee's hurting, if you sort of know why, or maybe because my ITBs are getting tight. I've got friends that stop running because they get sore knees, but I know I just get on a foam roller and, like, I know what to do through um, yeah. through all my time with footy and from learning from those guys. So I've got a quick story about Dean Benton. Um, so I think you guys were doing, like, remote training groups um, in 2011, and I think they were letting you guys play shoot shield and... I was living with Palms at the time. Is this at Ramwick Oval, Coochie Oval or something? I think I think so, if my memory serves. But um, I was living with Palms at the time. We went grocery shopping and he's just whacked like steak, as much steak as you can get. And and um, apparently one of the big things that Dean said is is having steak for breakfast. So Palms, Palms was eating like, like absurd amounts of steak for, for breakfast. <laughs> and I, I, I'd never heard of that before and I was just going... Well, but he, he probably spent 300 bucks more on, on just on meat. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> the, 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 the sugary cereal companies wouldn't like hearing that. But um, my favourite with Palm, so that for 2012 when we went to South Africa, and obviously the Africans love their meat, I remember going to team breakfast and seeing Palm's plate was two sirloins. Then I, stacked on top of that was beef mince. With then it was either bacon or prosciutto laid on top of that, and he used to sit in there just. And it's but, good for I mean, it's good for you. Ask, you I mean, you asked Palms what that sort of diet did did for all his lifting, and um, he was in probably yeah. Some, I mean, he's in tremendous shape now, Palms, but um, he was just, yeah. I mean, he was always bloody unbelievably strong, but I remember chatting to him around that um, around that time. Yeah, when they were in Sydney, and we were there for Wallabies. I catch up with Palms, and he was like. I was going, oh, what's the new trainer like? What's Jake White like? And he's like, oh, mate, they're just on to, into us about our eating. And he said, all oh, my lifts are going up and it's all because of, and he said, yeah, it's all because of his diet. He'd made changes to his diet and, uh, yeah. It's, no, it it's, learned, a massive, yeah. it's a massive thing. It's a massive thing. I wish I'd learned it years ago. Um, probably I might have gone better than I did go. Because it's uh, just on that, on diet, like it's, I think we're like, as a it's human race, we're only just starting to know, I think we know if we eat too much, we get fat, but we're only just really sort of society starting, well, science is really figuring out what food does to us and to our body composition and how it affects our brain and all our organs. But it's it really, it, it's kind of like we didn't realise smoking was bad for us 80 years ago. And I think now everyone, like it's just, it's so important getting the, the right diet, but it is um or for having optimal health, like food is, uh, for me, changing my diet's just, it's changed my life and getting a healthy respect for it and, and giving it a bit of time has been, um, yeah, been tremendously beneficial. So the science and the knowledge behind diet has started to come out a bit more? But there's a lot of bullshit about it as well. Like there's so that's, much. That's the thing I think people struggle uh, with is deciphering through all the bullshit to find out what actually works because there's so many people online. You only have to jump on Instagram any day and there's some guy or girl trying to sell something. Yeah, and like what is healthy? Like, okay, you, you tell me a drink, Chubby, and I'll tell you I'll tell you whether it's healthy or not or like find fault in it. So just, just name, tell me what's the healthiest drink you could think of right now. Uh, apart from water, power. Well, okay, water, water doesn't have enough protein in it. 
you know so, <laughs> so like my, my, my point is like anything um like that's put out as healthy you get people from all sorts of you know, academia and from um, the fitness industry they're all criticizing it and everyone's trying to be you know this diet expert but that's with alpha what we're trying to do is I've blocked all that nutrition advice out and I'm literally just experimenting and focusing on what I eat and what makes me feel good. I have, I, sometimes I'll see what other people are doing and I might give that a try, but I think all our genetics are all so different. Our tastes are different. Our like budgets for spending on food are different. So people really need to figure out what works best for them rather than trying to decipher through all the bullshit. And I mean, there's a lot of truth and there's a lot of bullshit and it's really hard to know what how to eat well so that's why I, i'm a big believer of just focusing and tracking what i eat and just what makes me feel good oh i ate all this today i feel great right i'll eat that or if i ate that or it didn't make me feel as good well maybe i won't eat it as often or so just been trying to figure out what works best for me is that that's what alfred's about and i'm still still um even though i've lost a lot of weight i'm still making small changes still doing little experiments to just yeah, find the perfect diet for me because it is um, yeah. What are you weighing now? No, it absolutely makes absolutely makes sense. It's so like I, there's I've just so much people making money off having everyone confused about what it what it takes to lose weight. There's so much BS and people profiting at, profiting off people's confusion and then like preying on their insecurities. And I know I used to buy every supplement and like try and go on every diet because I really wanted to lose the weight. But as soon as I just focused on what I'm doing and just made small gradual changes, I've never been, never had a problem again. So I'm about 103, 102, 103 at the moment, but. What were um, you on your max? What were you on your max? 128. 128. So that wouldn't have been fit Benny A. That would have been. That was ben. uni, uni Benny A. My, and during my rugby, I think my heaviest was about 124, 125. My 128 is my all-time heaviest when I was at uni. I think I was about 20 then. Do you feel better? Oh, mate. I never want to go back. I just have more energy. Like everything in life is easier. Just day-to-day -day getting around is easier. And I think anyone can do it once people just focus on them. They, they focus on what they're doing and they take the time. Um, I was, I think, I don't, one of the blogs I wrote about that I was in this cycle where I would not pay attention to what I was eating and I'd eat way too much or I then start feeling fat and then I just change my diet completely and I'd only eat salad and I'd pretty much starve myself until eventually I'd run out of puff and then I'd just go right back. And I was just stuck in this cycle. And I think there's a lot of people in the fitness industry that are exacerbating that cycle of human nature. So that's why I track because it helps me to find that nice sort of balance where I just make, you know, small gradual changes. I don't overdo it. Um, and I never make a change to my diet unless I can, unless I think I can keep it up forever. If yeah. I don't, like, so if I'm trying to go salads three or salad three meals a day, I just go, if I can't keep this up for the rest of my life, why am I even bothering? Cause I'll eventually quit at some point. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you know, rather than lim limiting yourself, you can have a little bit of chocolate now and again, as long as it's it's still under your energy for that day and you don't have like a whole block of chocolate. So you can sort of like rather than just going, I'm doing keto, I'm not eating carbs, I'm only eating this. Is, is that kind yeah, of... It's like when I track, like I, I eat two ice creams during the week instead of five and just having three less, that's led to some weight loss. Now, I, if I cut it down to one ice cream a week and I do that over a long period of time, that's going to lead to more weight loss. And if I cut it down to zero ice creams, that'll lead to even more weight loss. But I like eating ice cream and I feel really good at the moment. So why would I stop enjoying the foods? And I know people, yeah, they, they want to go keto because they just want to lose the weight really quickly and they will, but then it'll all come back when you can't keep up with it. I'm just a big believer in just... I know people want to lose it really quickly and just be there and be done with it, but you're just going to go straight back up eventually at some point. So I'm just a big believer in just taking your time, making small steps. And once you get there, you're there forever. Like I'm about losing the weight forever. And so, um, so I've took my time, but the, the great irony is once I started taking my time, it, it all came off really quickly. So what's your goal weight? Oh, 99. I've plotted. I've been stuck 102 for about two years now. It's just, 
Like I know I'd have to make ex these extra changes to what I want, like what I'd have to eat and I'd have to exercise more, but I don't want to exercise more because I want to do more work and yeah. I don't want to cut out more. F well, I haven't cut out anything that I like. I just eat things that I like a little bit less often. Um, I don't cut no, any, I haven't cut. That, no, I think that, and that's what we're teaching our kids. It's like, it's not, you can't have this, you can't have that. There's, there's sometimes food and then there's everyday food. Like, yeah. I think that's people, they think about cutting foods out. I think it's more about just eating them less. And the great the irony is that I actually enjoy my ice cream more now than ever because I don't have it as often. So yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's my ice cream day. I'm off to Messina and I fucking love it. I love it way more than if I was just eating ice cream every day because same thing with you know, beer, mate. You have a beer once every so often. It's far more enjoyable oh, the than best. having oh. every and because in the meantime, if you're feeling really good, you're making great progress in your work, you're doing awesome, you know, you're feeling great. And then, man, when it comes time to celebrate and have some beers and ice cream, mate, it's even better. A couple more questions for you. I'm really grateful for your time. When you look back over your career, do you have any regrets? Oh, there's stuff I wish I did better. I don't know. I guess it's this is more a question of like, do you believe in regret or not? Like I look back and I gave it my best. I gave it my absolute best and I have no regrets around that. But there's stuff, oh, if I got to go back 100%, there's stuff I would change. Like and the thing, the thing that like if I could change one thing over my whole career would have been, so in that Lion series in 2013, so I got, I was really lucky, got to play my 50th test in the second test, which we won on the bell and um, I'd, I'd watched the 2001 series every minute of it. It was the most unbelievable series. And then to even be a part of it, it just made my head spin, let alone, you know, the scrum was a big focal point of that series. And, you know, so I was pretty firmly in the spotlight most of that series. And there, the stress, the stress and pressure, that was pretty, was unbelievably tough. But after the second test, you know, you go back in the change room and after, if it's your first test or your 50th or whatever, you get presented with your cap and you have to do a little speech. And I just remember being absolutely speechless. Like I could, I can hardly say anything. I can't remember exactly what I said, but I just guess I wish I'd been calmer and, and spoken clearly because that was a really, looking back, I, I, it may not have done anything. We may still could have got flogged in that final, uh, in, in the third test. We got absolutely blown off the paddock. I got sent off early. It just absolute nightmare, absolute nightmare of a night. But, I mean, I know I trained as hard and prepared as best I could for it, but I just, I wish I'd been um, calmer you, you, and... You wish you'd spoke differently? Yeah, I wish I'd spoken clearly and just had been radiated calm and confidence. I think I was just, I was stressed. I was like... I was so relieved we'd won, but then I was like, oh, fuck, we got to go through this again. Another Lions test. I mean, I don't know if you spoke to Kieran Reid about his Lions series. Like, that would have been unbelievably tough those last few weeks for – they well, they drew they drew their series and it all sort of went a bit pear-shaped when Sonny Bill got red-carded. But that – I think with those Lions series, is that, is that, that's once in a lifetime. Like, unless you're a, a European player, you might get to go on a few tours. But if you're um, – you know, World Cups come every four years, Lions tours come every 12. And so there was, yeah, there's no tomorrows after a Lions series. So that was, yeah, losing that, getting blown away in that third test was my biggest disappointment by a long way because we played so well in the first two tests and had been so close, but to just get humiliated. Um, and, yeah, I think, yeah, I just wish I'd spoken better after that second test. Okay. Who's the best prop you ever scrummed against? Daniel Palmer, uh, with the exception yeah. of with the exception of Palms, because he's a bit he, with the exception of Palms. There's a French prop, Nicholas Mass, tight end. He was around 2011, 12. He was. Oof. He was. He wasn't Short. a big guy, was he? Nah, but he just awkward, really awkward, and just um, and he always had a big hooker with him, William Savat. So those two together were the most damaging hooker tight end combo I ever um, scrummed against easily. What's we got to scrum against Andrew Sheridan as well. That was that was pretty awesome. Wasn't many. Well, lucky there wasn't many scrums that day. I mean, it was twenty ten. I think he'd come back from injury. He had a heap of neck issues, and it might have been one of his last tests for England. Actually, um, he I mean, was. 
He was a monster, yeah. But um, yeah, no, he, they're special. But, but Palms, he was absolutely, he was awesome. Where's your favourite touring destination that you've ever been to? Cape Town. I mean, probably everyone would say that. Is everyone all, the, all the front rowers say that. Definitely. Yeah, almost the best sushi place I've ever been to is yeah, Cape Town. I mean, I love the UK. I got a lot of friends, especially because I'd been um, at Bedford sort of a year or two before I made the Wallabies. And then so every tour to the UK, I'd go and catch up with friends or they'd come down from when we play England. And um, I always loved touring the UK. Absolutely loved it. I've got family. I, I have a British passport as well as Australian one. So, um, yeah, love touring the UK. Were you ever tempted to go spend a year there at the back end of the career or you were pretty happy to stay and finish off at the Brumbies? Uh, I was tempted to go to Leicester just for a little bit, um, just for just a short short contract. But once we had kids and everything, no, I didn't want to have to uproot them. I, I'd been moved around a lot as a kid. We moved four or five times. And so I just, we're really happy here. And so it, I was keen maybe just go for a short stint, but no, it just, life's good down here in the Barra. It's too, life's too easy. So, mate, it's Canberra is an underrated secret. Every time I've been there, I've had a magnificent time. The food's good, the nightlife's good. I've never had a bad coffee there, and it's really quiet. So I can see why it's guys. It's bit cold, here. bit bit cold at the moment, but I, I don't mind the cold. So we just that, that's yeah, the we, one downside, and you're not near the beach. Well, for three or four for about five months of the year or six months of the year, Canberra is the best city in Australia, my opinion, like in spring and autumn when the weather's like in that, that nice medium, it's so good. But we're obviously the cold's tough. But then in summer when it's stinking hot and you're not near a beach, that's tough. But in those spring and autumn, it's just, it's, it's awesome. Mate, last question for you. What advice would you give 18-year-old Ben Alexander? Track your food. <laughs> yep. That's it. Yep. Well, I, probably higher than that. Track my energy and be mindful of what influences my energy. So that, um, yeah, that's sort of the framework I look. I make everyday decisions with. Does this give me energy, or is this a good use of my energy, or does it drain my energy? Is it a waste of my uh, energy? Because I think we're told, you know, you know, to prioritize our time um, and, and money, and it's well. So it used to be, you know, pro, um, maybe however long ago it was always money was sort of our top priority now i think everyone in society it's a lot about time like time is money and you know prioritize your time and be careful with every minute you spend but i'm a big believer in prioritizing my energy and just doing things before i start deciding about time um, i'm like yeah is this a good use of my energy does this give me energy you know is this person i'm hanging out with are they um, a positive, fun person to be around, or are they found negative and they're just chipping away at me, trying to drain my energy? So I'm not, I don't, you know, I'm not believer in the, the you know, that the energy comes from the stars and crystals and stuff, but I do believe there's this um, personal energy. I think it's it, it, and it's in within our control, not not so much like a, yeah, not not relied on the stars or the time of year or whatever. Um, yeah, so you'll apply, your you'll apply that to all aspects of your life, people you associate with, people you do business with, people you talk to as well. And what, what, what I do and don't agree to do, I'm like, this, yeah, does this excite me? Does this give me energy? If it, will I enjoy doing it? And if the answer is yes, I'll say, yep, no worries, I'll, I'll give it a go, I'll do it. But um, sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong, but I'm pretty quickly, if I go, oh, this is, this is not a lot of fun, I'm not really enjoying it, well, I'll... I'll I'll scrap it pretty quick, but um, yeah, that that's sort of just the question I always ask myself because I don't want to belittle mental health uh, stuff, but yeah. I do, or because it is, it's a, I think it's the biggest issue we face today. But I I honestly think most of a lot of mental health stuff, and when I notice my thinking gets a bit a bit dark and a bit full of doubt, it's literally when I just feel I've got feel like crap. I don't have much energy. As soon as I've got energy, I've had a good night's sleep, I'm eating well, I'm doing things that you know, light my tires, I'm all good. I mean, I'm sure I've been reading your posts about how much energy you've got at the moment, getting married, doing doing this, doing all your stuff, how much energy it's giving you. Yes. Um, I just, 
I just, yeah, I, I think a lot of mental health and obesity stuff is tied around people just feel like crap and they got low energy. So making your, if I was going to chat to a young 18 year old Ben, I would say, mate, just prioritize your energy. Um, Man, outside of like, you know, taking energy, having energy drinks and doing drugs and stuff that'll give you short term hits of energy. Obviously, caveat the advice with that, uh, avoiding those sort of things. But Man, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with that more. Um, maybe two weeks ago, I was so I've been trying to do this as like a side thing for a while. But two weeks ago, I was working at a place that was a terrible environment. So since then, I've I, I've quit that. I'm doing this full time. Like my day today is ridiculous. I did kickboxing this morning. I've uh, had a double espresso and some food, some good food. Get to talk to you. Uh, I'm going to go for a run after this, you know, do some videos this afternoon. And you're right. I've got more energy than I had two weeks ago because I'm doing good things. Um, and they say businesses, businesses only really die when the people that are running them run out of energy for them. You know, when the business becomes a drain and you don't enjoy the people you're working with, it is, it's this, maybe it doesn't get talked a lot about enough because it's hard to quantify energy, like and how you feel, but I, so I use an Oura ring that tracks my sleep and it gives me a readiness score in the morning. So um, so I don't just track my food. I mean, Al, I use Alfred to track my food. I use Strava to track my exercise. I use my Oura ring to track my sleep. So I sort of try and track all these variables that impact my energy. And so now I'm getting very good at uh, or trying to get more self-aware at, oh, if I feel crap, I sort of I know why. I go, oh, it's because yeah. I did this. And just, just change that and then I start feeling good again or... What was the uh, exercise tracking one you mentioned? Strava. Okay. I haven't heard of that one. Is, uh, is it similar to like a work kind of thing or is it totally different? Uh, it's more. It's a social network connecting the world's athletes. So you wear an Apple okay. Watch or whatever. You go for a run or a ride or you go for a gym and your, ex, your workout gets posted uh, online and all your friends can see and comment, um, you know, what you did. Uh, and it's awesome. And you can set challenges as a group. We have a group of my uni mates. We've got a lead, a weekly leaderboard. So at the end of the week, we see, oh, who's done the most Ks? And we go, hey, well done, Grifty. If you had a big week, I'll beat you next week. And so it just, yeah, because we don't, so we're still exercising together. Even though we're not physically exercising together, we are still doing it together yeah. uh, digitally and we're still connected. And I think, yeah, Strava is going to be a really big, yeah, one of the big social platforms of the future. It's just awesome. I absolutely love Strava. And I guess doing work that you find meaningful as well, like what you're doing with Alfred, which is is a worthy pursuit, um, would give you energy as well. Big time. And that's the hard, one of the hardest things with retiring we sort of spoke about before was that rugby gives you a lot of energy. It's like the pursuit of winning the title or trying to make the what like that pursuit – uh, of excellence gives you a ton of energy makes you want to get up in the morning and go train um, and try to find a, a job that is as meaningful and gives you as much energy and retirement is tough and I just was super lucky that I'd found what I wanted to do my challenge and why I say I'm still transitioning is trying to make it sustainable so uh, we're on the right track and everything's heading in the right the right direction but we just still got a lot of work to do before um, yeah it starts generating generating decent revenue so I can keep working on it forever. What did you call it, Alfred? I forgot to ask this earlier. Batman's butler. He helps you become the hero. I love it. <laughs> so he, that, he, he's your right-hand man, does all your work, so he'll do all your tracking for you, so you just go out and just do what you need to do. That's sensational. I was thinking like Alfredo, maybe it was a nickname that you had along the way, but no, mate, that's great. Um <laughs> Let's finish on that, mate. Thanks so much for your time. I truly appreciate it. How can people find you online? Because you got some, you're very active on social media. You've got a blog. How can people find you? Yeah, so on Twitter, Benny underscore Alexander or um, Ben A one nine eight four on Instagram. But and then my link, my links to my blogs are on are from those sites. So if you just follow me on Instagram or um, Twitter, yeah, you'll be able to find links to everything else from there. I just got to ask with the blog do you do you have like a blog schedule that you use or do you just go i feel like writing i'm gonna put something out i'm still figuring that out as i go so that was um 
last year when I was really struggling to balance everything, I started writing and it just, it's just helps me clear my thoughts up and help then share it with people who I, whose help I need. So I share some of the Alfred stuff with the team. So they sort of understand what I'm thinking. And so it's, yeah, I've, it's just, I've been enjoying it. It's giving me energy writing. So um, I've been trying to be consistent with it, but it is, um, I guess I probably put too high expectations on myself to write a, a masterpiece every week. Um, and it, so I'll probably just, yeah. Do, 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 you find it helps, do you find it helps clarify your thinking? Absolutely. That, yeah. If you can't write it and, and communicate it, you're not really thinking clearly. So that the other, I realized, yeah, I was in a rush and I'd be trying to rush, race around and do all these things, but the process of writing just forces me to sit, be still, like I'll go have a sauna and then I'll just come down and just start writing and it just, it's funny, yeah, it just starts flowing out of my head a lot a lot easier. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm only asking because I, I found the same thing. I think I've only written four blogs, but I was trying to do it every week and then I'd write and I'd go, what the fuck are you talking about? But if you really sit down and force yourself to clarify exactly what you're trying to say, it, it actually helps your head as well. And I always, I always feel lighter after I do it. I'm like, ah. I got that thought out. It's now on my blog, done. It's there forever. I don't need to like worry about losing that thought. Um, it's like it's sort of captured in a safe and it's there. I've tried to do it nice and neatly. So if anyone wants to go and read my blog, they, there's all, you know, all my thoughts. And uh, it's something I'll keep up forever. I'll keep blogging. I won't do it every week, but I'm still trying to figure out what's the best sort of frequency. Maybe it's once a month or once a fortnight. I don't think I'll keep up every week. But um, no, I'm, I'm loving it. Couldn't recommend it more for anyone, for everyone that just want, who just got a lot of thoughts, just get it. Even if no one reads it, um, I think it's a great. Um, the fact cool. that you're blogging it, yeah, and you're and you're going to make it public, it sort of puts a bit of onus on yourself to do a good job of it. Job of it. Yeah, yeah. Something something I try and do, like I, I purely do it for myself as like a a thing to look back on and and see where you were at that time. So, like, what I found in business is I've learned way more from actually being in business than you could have ever studied and just trying to find yep. where this is going and, and tracking that for myself, which is it's been really helpful to look back and go, oh, you learned this, you learned that, you've done this. So, yeah, I think it's a useful tool as well, and I couldn't recommend it enough to anyone, mate. Well, Substack, Substack's the site I use. It's free for anyone to set, set up a blog and it's – Super, it's awesome tool. Um, yeah, so substack.com, check it out. Mate, I'll, I'll leave you alone. Thank you for your time. Um, I could talk to you all day, mate. Best of luck with everything and thank you so much. Too easy, Chubby. I'll send you a link to Strava and Substack in a sec. Mate, that'd be good. That'd be good. Thanks, buddy. You awesome, have a good mate. day. You too. Take care. Catch you, mate.